Good evening. It's Men's Week at the Golden Door. And tonight, we're pleased to have Joe Parent, Dr. Joe Parent, who has coached the mental game in business life and golf for over 30 years, a distinguished PGA Tour instructor. He has attracted such clients and major champions as his Vinya Singh, I'm hoping I'm saying that correctly, Vijay Singh, Christy Kerr, and a lot of others. I can't even name them all. He's been featured in CNN, NBC's Today in New York, HBO Sports, ESPN, and many appearance on the Golf Channel. He's coached Michael Bolton, that's what I was looking for, Kevin James, George Lopez, Hall of Fame running back Marcus Allen, World Championship Oscar De La Hoya, and many other elite and celebrity golfers. His first book, the bestseller, Zen Golf, Mastering the Mental Game, is now in its 17th printing. There's over a quarter of a million copies in print worldwide, including foreign editions in seven languages. You ready? I'm ready. You've been teaching a breakthrough program for over three decades. What's the difference between coaching a mental game in golf versus a mental game in business? Well, you know, there's a saying that uh, golf and life are a lot alike. It's just golf's a little more complicated. But the, uh, the principles are very much the same because <clears throat> what I teach is performance psychology, how you perform. And, and every project, every action has uh, a beginning, a middle, and an end. And so I use the PAR system, which is preparation, action, response to results. How you prepare for your project, how you prepare for your golf shot, how you prepare for a tournament, then what's the quality of your action? Is it present? or is it scattered? And then how do you pay attention and respond to the results so that you get and can take the feedback and have it improve your preparation, improve your future action, and therefore have a cycle of continuous improvement? That works in golf, in other sports, uh, in business, in the performing arts. Everything that, uh, that I work on is about how you get out of your own way and get the most out of your abilities. Well, you're a golfer yourself. You've played for how long? Since I was a teenager, so many, many years. And you're also, I understand, a Buddhist. Yes, that's right. So at what point did you become a Buddhist? I was, I guess, 21. And did that, do you think that becoming the Buddhist affect your golf? That became my life. That became your life. I was, uh, the first moment of my experience in, on that path, on the, on the path of awakening, because if you were to translate Buddhism into English, it would translate as awakeism. That's what it means. Right. So um, I was at Cornell as an undergraduate and had a moment where I said, you know, what do I want to do with my life? Uh, because I, didn't, I was in engineering and that was my father's profession and I was kind of on a track, on a conveyor belt. And I didn't really like where it was going. So I started asking myself some questions. And, you know, what did I want to do with my life? And what was I really interested in? And it was as if my own voice was saying, well, I'm interested in why I do the crazy, which I mean self-defeating things that I do, and why other people do, and how to stop doing it. And I said, well, that sounds like psychology. So I, I headed for the psych department. And, and that was the start of the shift. Uh, and then I was with a friend, who, and I, we were talking about deep topics, life and death, and he said, well, here's this book. You should check it out. And I started reading it, and I said, well, I already think that, already think that. Um, that makes sense. That makes sense. And I finished, and I said, I'm a Buddhist, and I didn't even know it. So that was really the moment. You know, not everybody is a, a Buddhist. So how did you gain such popularity with your books. What was the message about your Zen golf that resonated in so many countries? Well, it, it's really interesting because if you, if you look at the, the golf field, the thing about golfers is uh, they're willing to try almost anything to get better. Uh, and when people have tried it, the whole point is the, it's such a mental game. And the thing about golf is when you, as soon as you hit the ball, you know what your state of mind was. 
It's well, an immediate. It's an I, immediate I live reflection. on a golf course. Yes. And and you can hear people's expression yes, of their state of mind. They're usually <laughs> clubbing the grass that, with their and, clubs. That's right. And so when when given an opportunity to change that perspective, change their language, change the way that they go about um, experiencing themselves on the golf course, once people had a taste of that, it didn't matter. What it, whether it was called Zen or Buddhism or what it was, it was about understanding how your mind works and how you can make it your ally instead of your enemy. Because every golfer knows that their mind can really be their enemy and can be their downfall. So to give them a handle. Now, it, there are a lot of sports psychology books out and they all say, clear your mind, focus, be in the present. The thing that made a difference and why I feel Zen golf is so popular is it, it says that, but it tells you how. People, you know, I had students who said, I was working with this sports psychologist. He said, don't, he said, um, you're being too hard on yourself. And, he, and I said, well, what should I do? And the, and the player said uh, that the sports psychologist said, don't be. Well, that right. doesn't do you a right. lot of good if you are. Right. But I want to give you a path to say, Here's a path, here's a technique that you can change the unhelpful habits that you have so, so and cultivate helpful ones. Well, let's go to the beginning of that path. What would be that, I'm, we're new, we're all here listening. Mm -hmm. What would be the first thing you would say that was the beginning of that technique or path? The first thing is recognition. If you don't know what's going on, you can't make a change. So the, the two aspects are recognition and undoing the unhelpful habits. And that's mindfulness. And that's where it connects with people because it's beyond the Buddhist tradition. Mindfulness is the practice of being more in the here and now. Well, you know, present. that's interesting. You know, mindfulness, gonna, you know, it's a topic that we kind of are circling on. Anderson Cooper just did a piece on going to a retreat where he had no cell phones and no Blackberries and no iPads and no television. Mm -hmm. And he never thought he could get through it. And he found it incredible. Do you not think that in today's world where guests almost complain if you don't have enough attaching equipment and connectivity mm -hmm. that you're behind the times? Are we losing something in this world of digital connective te you know, technology? Uh, to the extent that we are continually reading messages from the past and thinking about what we're going to say in the future, it gets us out of the present moment. Uh, I think that one of the things that happens is we get so distracted uh, it's almost like we have um, digital ADD, that we're afraid we're going to miss something. You know, uh, I, I think that the notion of attention deficit disorder is just that the kids and adults who have it are trying to pay attention to so many things right, at once right. that they don't stay on any one thing right. at any one time. And that's what we're doing with all our devices and all, all the activities. That doesn't mean they're bad. That means we don't know how to use them. And that's where mindfulness comes in, of knowing what you're doing while you're doing it so that you can make a choice and say, this is the time when I'm looking at my emails, and now I'm done looking at my emails, and this is the time when I'm talking to you. Right. As opposed to, oh, hang on, there's a text, I'll, I'll get, uh, let me get back to you. And you're back and forth and back and forth, and you're not really present. Do you think that, that though, in the world <coughs> of sport, though, that golf, I mean, clearly football, kind of hard to imagine that is mindful. But do you think in the world of sports, and I, I want to make a mm -hmm. connection with Jack Nicholson in a second, do you think in the world of sports it's hard to be mindful and, and golf just is one of those kind of mindful sports? I think Can you be mindful in other sports, like uh, tennis? Ab absolutely. Well, I, how about football? Pete Carroll is using that for the Seattle Seahawks, and they have been, they almost won the Super Bowl, they wow. won a Super Bowl, and he's using that approach of uh, positive choices rather than uh, punishment to get the most out of his players. Positive choices for himself and what Positive he does. Positive choices for all the players and oh. say, you have the capability of excellence rather than what's wrong with you that you screwed up that play. It's a whole different perspective of focusing on what's right with you rather than beating you down for what's wrong with you. And, and to be able to do that, uh, one of the players said, I didn't know whether I was in a team meeting or a meditation session. Really? And that is getting back to the present moment. Because if you're a defensive back and you're thinking about the, the, uh, the touchdown that got scored on you on the last play, you're not in the present. You're not going to be there for the next play. 
You have to recognize what happened, learn from it, and move on. And that's what he's teaching in football, that's what I teach in golf, that's what I teach in any sport that I work with. Do you find your own practice being able to cross over from golf to go to other sports teams Absolutely. As, I, a as a consultant uh, to help them? I, I just finished Zen Tennis this year, mm -hmm. so that book is going to be available. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have coached bowling, car racing, um, I'm working, uh, co-authoring a book on billiards, snooker, really? and pool. Oh my gosh. Uh, and I had a trap shooting artist, a uh, trap shoot uh, specialist, uh, like a state champion in, in target shooting, say that Zen Golf was the best book for target shooting. Well, so it, it really generalizes to anything. That's interesting. You once said in your book, Zen Golf, you acknowledge Jack Nicklaus mm -hmm. for his unsurpassed mental game. So who in today's current lineup of the games have, can you say is equal to Jack Nicklaus? I think one of the players that I would recognize for that is Jordan Spieth. And the reason for that is Jack Nicklaus had, uh, he never had a sports psychologist, but he had an ability to compartmentalize. When he was playing golf, that's all he thought about. When he left the golf course, he was with his family, that's all he thought about. When he was doing business, that's all he thought about. He could exclude the rest and focus only on what he chose to focus on. And that's really the essence of mindfulness practice, and that is being aware of what your chosen object of attention is and recognizing other things are going on, but you stay focused on that. Jordan Spieth, when uh, they were talking about that, when he goes home to his family, if there's golf on the TV and he walks in the room, they have to turn it off. Oh my goodness. That's, that's not golf time. And when he's on the golf course, that's not family time. And I think he's got a tremendous ability to, uh, to compartmentalize, which is why I think he's going to uh, sit, you know, stay at the top for a long time. So is that really the message? Is the message that you sort of compartmentalize your life so you can focus on it? The, the message is to be able to pay attention to what you're focused on and not jump from one thing to another to another. And, and there are many studies that say there's no, there's no real thing called multitasking. What multitasking is, is, is just what I said, jumping from one task to another to another. And the studies have shown that when you do that, your efficiency at any of the tasks is less and less and less. So that if you're operating at 80% efficiency and you do three tasks, the total amount of efficiency is going to be more like 40%. So the one the, thing at a time. So the guys were always right. It was always said that the gentlemen always do one thing at a time and the women are always multitasking. Um, is that a gender issue or do I, you think that's not? I don't not? think it's a gender issue and in modern society I think everybody's expected to do that. In today's world, for uh, sure. Women are better at it because they have to be because they have to juggle Darn. they have to juggle so many things, but I knew again there was a catch. again it's, it's not multitasking, it's being able to do what you're doing, pay attention to it, finish it, and then move on to the next thing. And it's better if you can let go of what you were just working on and move to the next thing. You once said the four pillars of a fit mind are strength, flexibility, balance, and stamina. Mm -hmm. How often do you see all four of these traits? Well, isn't it, interesting, in, isn't it interesting that they're the same traits that you would describe to a world-class athlete about their body, their physical skills and their mental skills? Uh, I think that there are different levels of accomplishment in those, and when you have world champions, they are very accomplished in both the physical capabilities of that and the mental capabilities that go along with those. Um, but anybody can develop more strength, stamina, balance, and flexibility in their minds, but you have to practice. I, I ask athletes who come to work with me, I said, so do you do physical workouts? And they say, oh yeah, how many times? Oh, three, four times a week for uh, an hour to two hours. I said, and how many mental workouts do you do a week? They say, none. I said, what part of the game is mental? And they said, more than, you know, a very, very high percent. Then I said, why don't you put some time into <coughs> mental training? And that's what I offer them, mental conditioning. So that's, that's sort of almost my next question. That's perfect. So the mind influences the body. So what's an example of mental training? We all are here to 
at the Golden Door, mm -hmm. you know, mind, body, spirit. We did, What's a uh, good example? We did a little bit of that in the mindfulness session uh, uh, in the studio earlier tonight. Uh, and there are different sequences, different phases. In the same way that you would do stretching and warm up before a physical session, you work with your posture and get your breathing stabilized and get yourself grounded and settled in a mental game session. Then you want to work on uh, tight focus. If you're, uh, if you're taming a dog, for example, you don't give them a long leash, you keep them really close on the leash and you keep them close to you. So you want to keep your mind in close and, and catch it whenever it moves. So there's a, a practice called close placement in which you pay attention to your breathing, but it's, it's more the internal sensation of your breathing. And whenever your mind wanders, you come back. Then you can expand your awareness to your perceptions and your environment once your mind is tamed. And then beyond that, you open to a big perspective of uh, general awareness so that you're open to whatever is coming to you. And that provides you the agility, the flexibility, the, uh, the grounding practice provides you the balance, and the practice of coming back to the present moment is your strength of mind, your willpower. Well, you mentioned in your book, which I did get to read, that you've time-tested mindful awareness techniques and exercises. Well, I, I haven't just time-tested it. It's 2,500 years That's, of time-testing. So testing. give us, is that an example, though? Give us two examples of a time-tested technique. A time-tested technique is the technique of labeling when your mind wanders. And what it does is it recognizes uh, what's going on at the moment. In other words, you're thinking, you're, you're aware of your breathing. You're aware of your breathing and you think, oh, this is very calming. You know, this is a lot like the yoga class I took last week. I wonder what happened to that yoga instructor. I think she said to move to, she moved to New York. You know, I really like New York. You know, next time I go to New York, there's this play I Oh, and all of a sudden, oh, you're in New York. You're right. four thoughts away from being in right. New York. So when you realize it, there's an aha moment, and you go, uh, I'm not in New York. And at that moment, the key is the choice. Do you keep going, or do you come back to here and now? Well, we should, that's a really good idea. We should be able to almost do that at all times of our day, because our minds are always wrought with noise and chatter. Exactly, and that's the purpose of mindfulness practice, that you start in a quiet environment and you, because you have to train yourself. You know, you, you don't start running a marathon by running a marathon. You do segmental training. And so you train yourself when there's not a lot of distraction and then you gradually move into uh, practicing mindfulness 24 seven. Like while you're walking. As much as you right. can. So we have sitting mindfulness practice, right. then you have walking mindfulness, right. and then you have mindfulness in action and one of, my, one of the things my teacher uh, explained was that when you move mindfully, you move more elegantly. So if I just grab a glass and I'm talking to you while I'm drinking, I'm not paying attention to that. But if I turn my attention to that and reach down, grab the glass and I'm aware that I'm drinking, and set it down without rushing, right. it becomes very elegant and he called that art in everyday life. That's very doable. That How many, is very doable. We're going to ask, talk about meditation in a second. You talk a lot about mental visualization, mm -hmm. training people to get the stresses out of their daily life. Are people today more stressed than ever before? That's a good question. Uh, you know, we, we talk about who's the greatest athlete of all time, and it's hard to compare eras. So I don't know if uh, the stress of a business deal matches with the stress of running away from a saber-toothed tiger. Uh, I don't think we can compare generations. No, probably not. But um, clearly there is more coming at us all the time. And the world is more complicated and more complex. So to the extent that that's happening, yes, it's more and more stressful. So is so it harder to, to be, be de-stressed? Is it harder to get to that place? Uh, I think so, uh, and part of the reason is we don't have the natural gaps that uh, right. people in traditional societies had. Um, if there weren't electric lights, 
You're you like, didn't do much after dark. Right, I was just going to say, I was just thinking <laughs> that when the sun went down, it was kind of over. When the sun went down? The soup is on the table, that, and you know, the lights are out, it. and you had all those kids, so that's, whatever. That's pretty much it. Not so sure. now there are so right. many options, and if you check your email right before you go to bed, yeah, exactly. then there's something, oh shoot, yeah, i got to yeah. deal with that. All of a sudden it's two in the morning, yeah. you got to get up at six to get ready to go to work. Whoa, that's stressful. Yeah. Um, I don't think there are the gaps. So we have places like this. We have, we have retreats that we have to go to to inject that gap into our lives and recharge our batteries and bring ourselves down from the speed. Because when we're stressed, what happens in our body is our energy moves up in our body and faster. And so what I find for athletes, they lose their connection with the ground and they're, they're, they're all in their head and moving, moving from up here, and their bodies and their minds aren't synchronized. Yeah. Well, when you're doing everything in everyday life, if you're spinning around, if you're moving up and faster, you miss things and you make bad decisions because you're not grounded and you're not moving through things methodically. That's the correspondence between golf and business, any sports and business, any performance, anything you're doing. You need to have your body and mind synchronized and the only place that your body can be is here. The only place your body can be in time is now. Your mind can go to the past and, and future, but you need to bring your mind to here and now where your body is, and then you can get the most out of your abilities. Interesting. So, meditation. With all of the research on meditation today, and there seems to be more talk about this than ever, and I, mm -hmm. I, I agree, it's probably one of the most important things we can add to our life. Is that something that you bring into your practice with your clients? Uh, I definitely do practice that would be described as traditional Buddhist meditation. But I like to not talk about it as meditation. That's because in our new age world, meditation has a lot of woo-woo and a lot of, uh, oh, I you know. just say om until you space out and go to a different astral plane. It doesn't plane. have to be like um, that. It, it doesn't have to Absolutely be that way. Absolutely not. So what I talk about is mindful awareness. You're mindful, which means you know what you're doing while you're doing it, and you're aware of your environment and, and whether you're present or not. Those are the two things that go together, mindfulness and awareness. And that's the practice that we're talking about. Uh, we can describe it as meditation, but I'd rather not. I'd rather talk about it, what it actually is. In your mind is full of your experience of the present moment. That's mindful. Aware is you are present to all the, f the full scope of your experience and all of your perceptions. But one of the one of the complaints in today's world is, of course, is that people are just too busy. They just don't have time. Uh, yes, I don't have time to to to, to meditate. be healthy. By the way, I Th don't have time true. to be healthy, and I don't have time to stop and get off the, tr the 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 track. There is a very interesting experience that people have when they make a point of sitting down and just taking a few minutes to sit still, let their minds settle. You know, it's like. Uh, muddy water, if you, take the spoon, if you take the stick out and stop stirring, eventually the mud settles. Well, you need to take the stick out, stop stirring, and just sit down and let your mind settle. Let your breathing happen by itself and start to add some space. And what happens is, this is really interesting, you take 10 minutes and do that and you add maybe an hour to your day. Now, you'd say, well, it seems like you're adding an hour to, a day, to your day. You actually add an hour to a day because you're not zooming around and wasting a lot of your time going, chasing dead ends. You, re, you, get to, you get more efficient, and you do things with more experience, so you actually experience what you're doing rather than zooming by and saying, what happened to today? Do you meditate? Absolutely. Every day? Um, at least a few minutes every day, Is there and a some time? days, some days longer. I find the best. Uh, let's be realistic. I get going with my day. I, I, my momentum carries me past. Oh, it's time to stop and sit. So you're still, you're not the sunset. S you're not done. Swing the legs over the side of the bed. Right. Sit there and do the practice. Then, if I have a chance later, that's great. But here's something I'd recommend. What usually happens is people think I don't have time. So. 
Here's a little exercise. Have a place in your home where there's a chair or a cushion where you meditate and some symbols in front of you that remind you of awareness. And go stand behind the seat, stand behind the cushion or the chair and give yourself a reason you can't sit down for two minutes. If you've got a good reason, get out of there and get going. If not, sit down for two minutes. Do you see corporate culture changing to allow in the future generations those moments that people can stop and it just isn't the 20 minute lunch break? Or you, let me ask the question a little bit differently. In China, when they, they take a nap, they actually sit mm -hmm. at their tables in Japan, they put their heads down, they literally go to sleep. It's the most amazing thing I've ever seen. <laughs> They're sound asleep at their desks. But they consider that time that they've gone to sleep a chance to regroup and get ready for the next, I'm sure, many hours that they have to work. Right. Do you think that's something that will ever become a part of people's work life? Well, one thing about corporate America is if something is going to help people be more productive, they'll usually find a way to incorporate that. And one of the uses of mindfulness practice right now is in corporate America. If you look at uh, Google and Apple and a lot of those companies, they have people coming in and teaching those classes and encouraging people to do the practice. Uh, I think that it's uh, a small version of the benefit of the practice, and I don't like to see it um, commoditized, right. but better that they do it that way than not at all. And once people do it a little bit, the practice takes care of itself. If they've, if they've learned how to do mindfulness practice and take 20 minutes and, and are able to do that, they see that it has benefits beyond work for their lives, and then they take it up as part of their lives. So I don't mind uh, introducing it that way. And I think that it's going to become more and more part of corporate America because we have no choice. Right. We have to have moments where we stop and regroup. Well, and the, the millennial generation, which is the next biggest, I believe, probably the most mm -hmm. dynamic generation since baby boomers, is clearly in the marketplace today. They grew up on digital. I mean, they are um, absolutely computer savvy, completely connected in every way, sense and form. Mm -hmm. Are they going to be even more difficult to learn how to stop? Uh, that's an interesting question. Again, I think that's a time will tell kind of yeah, question. Uh, at the same time, why not, you know, one of the things uh, about Buddhism that has come since for 2,500 years from India, Tibet, Japan, Europe, United States, it adapts to whatever is going on in the current culture and uses the tools. So you have, uh, uh, you have meditation apps <laughs> and right. you, have in, right. you have mindfulness apps that's and right. that's going to be their entree right? because that's it's a digital world. They're going to find a digital way to, to practice that. That's interesting. Now you just launched the best diet book ever. <laughs> I want to this will be in everybody's room tonight when you go into your rooms. The best diet book ever. Well, I didn't want to tell you how many diet books were in print because I thought that number would just about scare everybody. But there's a lot. There's a lot of diet books on the market today. And losing weight and being healthy are key messages clearly in our world today. Clearly that's one of the things we know about wellness. Before we read the whole book, which I look through a lot of it, it what would be the three pieces of, of wisdom that are going to come mm. from this best book that nobody else has in any other book. Three very tangible ideas, okay. or, or I guess suggestions. That's fine. Number one, um, most other books recommend that you eat one thing and don't eat another thing, and uh, eating these foods will be better, and these foods are worse for you, and they have recipes and everything. I have no recipes and no food recommendations. I saw that. Um, <laughs> there's a, there was a movie by Woody Allen called Sleeper many years ago, and he was a health food store owner who uh, had a hospital complication, was put to sleep cryogenically, and frozen for 200 years. And they wake him up, and uh, one of the doctors says, uh, so did he request anything for breakfast? And the other doctor says, yeah, something called uh, wheat germ, organic honey and tiger's milk. Oh, no. and, and the other doctor says, what are those? 
and he, he said, oh, those were magical, many years ago, they were thought to be magical substances that had life-preserving properties. And the, the, first doctor sa the, the first doctor says, you mean they didn't have deep fat? They didn't have steak or, or cream pies or hot fudge? <laughs> and he said, oh, well, in those days, they thought those things were unhealthy. Completely the opposite of what science has now proven to be true. Oh, my God. Incredible. And so, so um, we have high carb, low carb, high fat, low fat, all meat, no meat. I mean, it's a new fat every year. Right, that's the so, challenge. It's so confusing out there. So why pick one? And also, uh, I was talking to some of the gentlemen earlier. Um, if, would you go to an eye doctor who uh, took his glasses off and said, oh, these glasses work great for me, so it's the prescription I give to all my patients. Well, no one diet is going to work right. for everybody. Right. So here's the key to this book. It helps you accomplish your weight loss goals and your diet program, whatever it is, better because it helps you get out of your own way and accomplish things to the best of your abilities. Now, here's, uh, so that's one. That's one. Number two, number two is it's based on positive choice rather than punitive deprivation. Most diets say you can't do this, you can't do this, uh, you're limited to these many calories or these many points or this many, you know, and, and you feel deprived and you get resentful <laughs> and you say, I'm not doing this anymore. Also, you, you, it, it makes people feel punished for being overweight. That's an and, interesting and concept. That's, not, that's the opposite. And, and that's not right. And right. this says, no, you're not punished for being overweight. That's how you are right now but you have the potential to be thin. This is what it's gonna feel like, and I give exercises of what it will feel like to weigh less. It's a oh, special exercise of what it will feel like to weigh, weigh less. So you can always reflect on that and say, when you're looking at some food, you can say, would I rather eat that or would I rather weigh less? I'm gonna make a positive choice that I prefer. So that's the, that's that's the second. Two. The third is, a unique system of habit change based on uh, necessary intention. You have to have a strong intention and non-judgmental awareness. Again, not judging yourself. So when you slip, you don't judge yourself. You just notice and, and recognize that. So the initials that I just gave you are ninja. Necessary intention, oh non-judgmental awareness. The necessary intention uh, how many dieters does it take to change a light bulb? Only one, but the yeah. light bulb has to want to change. So, so um, you have to want to change right. to, to make That's something cool. happen. Again, you have to want to weigh less rather than eat what's in front of you. So I understand you practice this yourself. Yes, and I was 200 pounds, now I'm about 182. And how long so, did that take you? Um, about, I would say, Four months, That's not too bad. about a pound a week. Wow! Uh, and th but the key is that was uh, over a year ago, and okay, I've sustained. I've sustained. I got down to 178. That was a little light. 182 seems to be right on on the money. Sometimes a little less. Sometimes, well, 180 is is, is, is on the money for me. 182, I say, okay, that's enough. So so you you move your ceiling down little by little. So what inspires you today? What inspires me today is that there is a seed of wakefulness that is pervading the culture that people, it, it's, it's, it's rather polarized. At the same time that there are things are more and more and more horrible, like ISIS and, and everything that's going on there, and, and more and more extreme, the the fighting, uh, the political fighting, the, the national, nationalism movements of everybody hating everybody else. W while that's happening, on the other side, what's really happening is people saying, this is crazy. We can't live this way. We've got to find a different way. So that mindfulness and, and the possibility of wakefulness and the possibility of kindness are at the same time pervading our culture more and more and more. And that's exciting to me. What's next? When are you launching your book tour? That's um, 
This is the soft launch right. here at the we, Golden Door. By the door. way, that's true. We and are able to have this book first that's before right. we've even started book tour. And I want to repeat again that this is, I've checked, is in everybody's rooms when you go back into your rooms tonight. So you're getting the book first. That's right. And so what's next after your book tour? The uh, November 15th, there is a mindfulness conference in Los Angeles of many of the group mindfulness teachers from around the country uh, as part of uh, a group called Inside LA. Uh, and I'm going to be talking to them about the hard launch uh, to that group happening and then working with you here at the Golden Door to, um, to make something as positive as this place is available to people everywhere. Cool. So as we end each of our nights in our speaker series, we ask our guests to, I'm gonna ask you the same, to leave our guests, our loyal, incredible guests who come here every single week, to give a single golden nugget for our guests to take home. So, mm -hmm. Dr. Joe Parent, now it's your turn. Okay. What golden nugget would you be able to leave our guest tonight? Well, this is my favorite Zen style story. And uh, I have it in Zen golf, I have it in Zen tennis, I have a version of it in the Zen of dieting, in, in the best diet book ever, which is uh, Zen and the Art of Losing Weight is the subtitle. Uh, uh, a young boy had a statue, a family heirloom, a little clay statue, and he, he, he really was proud that he had this, this statue that had been in his family for a long, long time, but he always wished that were a, it were a gold statue rather than clay. So when he had time to uh, get some part-time jobs and was, a, and was old enough to, to earn a little money, as soon as he had enough, he went down to the jewelry store and he had the statue gold-plated. And now everybody said, oh, your statue is so beautiful. You have a gold statue. It's so nice. Uh, but the problem was gold plate doesn't stick to clay very well. So it kept coming off in little splotches. So he found himself using all his time and energy to keep the gold facade of his statue intact. Uh, one day his grandfather came home from a trip of many years. On the, in these stories, grandfathers go away for many years. And the young, young boy was excited about showing to him, but a little embarrassed that, that there were spots of clay showing through. And he assured him he was gonna get it covered up real soon. And the old man took the statue lovingly and he said, and, and he moistened a handkerchief. And he said, he started rubbing and he said, you know, when you were really young, this statue fell in the mud and got covered in clay and <gasps> you don't remember oh, that. No. But look here, and where he had rubbed, a bright yellow color shone through. And he said, you never had to cover your statue in gold. All you needed to do was gently remove the clay and reveal the solid gold statue you possessed all along. And so the golden nugget is, that's who you all are. You are the gold, you're not the clay. You just have to gently remove the clay and reveal the gold that is your nature.